must say, and what I've done is I've learned from painting for photographs all these years. Not how someone would see the landscape, but as you would see a photograph of an aerial landscape, looking down on mountains, looking down on rivers, looking at coastlines, working from maps, working from satellite images. That's giving me a language now to push my expressionistic impact further. And I'm going to be giving some close-ups of the kinds of edges that I'm getting. Here, I'm just loosely doing a grid that's divided into four parts, and it's the East African Rift Zone. What I'm trying to do right now with my work is balance realism and romanticism. The realist in me wants to show a real place, look at science, look at geography, look at geology, investigate the facts on the ground. The romanticist in me wants to have fun with that and play with it and create something that's unique, that's not just a duplication of a photograph, which to a large degree I was happy with in the past. Now I'm saying I want to go past that and push this other more expressive aspect. So I think we can see that in a lot of the details. And I'm going to be showing some close-ups when we cut this film together. Just a little bit about this particular place. This is the rift, the Indian plate, the African plate. They've collided together. This one's pushing north all the way up to the Middle East. I know this is Lake Victoria. I've heard about it. I know these are the major lakes. I know that the corridor of mountains is roughly in this fashion. There's two sides to this, you know, and there's this suture down the middle and the edge of the... Uh, coast, which I have to paint now to contain a flow. I haven't really talked about the paint. Uh, the thick stuff is oil, straight up oil. I occasionally use some alkyd. Some of this thinner is more alkyd. I'm applying it right out of the tube. I use gesture to get the stroke and the rhythm. I put that down and then I model it very quickly with a, a palette knife. I lift up on the mountains. And I've learned that the first stroke is usually the best stroke. So they're done very quickly, like an Asian painting. You do it, and then you step away and let it do its thing, because the more you mess with it, the worse it gets. After that's in, I do pores with enamel that I lay up as also a loaded and unloaded paint structure. In this case, it's actually a glass or a jar or a cup of paint. And depending on what order I put the enamel, how much I stir it, if I create bubbles, uh, if I wait till most of it gets to the bottom, if I don't wait till most of it gets to the bottom, I can create these marble effects by pouring it out. And these two techniques I've developed independently for about 30 years. I've never really figured out a way to combine them. Uh, one of the things that's happening now is I finally realize I can integrate them by pouring around the mountains and leaving the lowlands as pores and the highlands as impasto. And the edge needs to be contained or else the land just fills the whole ocean basin. So the edges are created just as a paint strategy to keep the paint in place. But I love what's happening because it's colliding and it's eating it and it's exactly like the geology which is pushing this material around, lifting it and taking it somewhere else. So we're, we're getting all of that in miniature. So I see them as kind of dynamic landscape paintings for uh, the 21st century. What do you guys think? Uh, questions, comments? <laughs> I, yeah, Walker. What, what I like how you're, uh, you use that black there, and how, I was wondering how you get that piano like uh, finish. Do you use like a heat gun? It's that's just in the pouring. Yeah, okay. it's poured so thickly, and enamel has a habit of leveling. Mm -hmm. and it'll reach that level surface, and if there is a little extra, it'll go off the edge, and so it cools. And I've learned how to pool it. I think this one's actually going to stay smooth. Sometimes if I pool them too much, they they buckle like crazy. Some of it I like. I, I like the little bit of buckling. I'm hoping this one stays relatively smooth. And is there a heat process involved with the enamel? No, no. Huh. It's, it's literally uh, very cool. Uh, Rust-oleum, high gloss, industrial enamel. They, they take uh, 
four or five days to dry. They're very thick. I need to keep the bugs out of them and stuff yeah. like that. That's the main thing that has. Bugs and dust.